Well, good evening, everybody. It's a great joy to have you here this evening and to see members from across the university and the different faculties. Um, as you know, uh, we take seriously inaugural lectures of our new professors, and uh, we do this. Um, we don't do it lightly because we appoint our professors carefully, and when they are appointed, we gather to celebrate these new appointments. Uh, tonight, I want to welcome you to a very special inaugural lecture because Professor David Bolt, as you will hear, is one of us, has been with us for over 10 years and has now achieved a personal chair and will give his lecture to us in a few moments. May I use this opportunity to also welcome his parents who are here. Um, very welcome. It's always nice to have the family and I gather other members of the family are here too, and you're all very, very welcome. These are family celebrations as well as the Hope family celebrating tonight. Two other special guests, if, if I may mention, is the Bishop of Belfast. Bishop Trainer is with us, who's just made it in, uh, to Liverpool, and uh, the principal of St. Mary's College, Professor Finn, is with us, Professor Peter Finn. They've come to talk to the university about how we can work together. It's a special delight to have you, Bishop and uh, Professor Finn. And so if I may do what Professor Newport would have done if he were here, he's in, on his way to Dubai at the moment, and um, I'm doing the Pro Vice Chancellor academics role today. Thank you, Eileen, for Professor uh, Newport's notes. It's a great pleasure then to introduce Professor David Bold. And often, as I said, when I introduce our inaugural lectures, I'm normally introducing fairly new colleagues. But David has been with us now for almost 10 years. And through his distinguished academic standing, has been promoted to a personal chair. <coughs> Professor Bold began his academic career with the attainment of a first class degree in literary studies at the University of Staffordshire. It was a mark of future success that even at this early stage of his career, he was awarded a prize for academic excellence. Professor, Professor Bold then went on to complete his PhD studies with the recognition provided by the Arts and Humanities Research Council through an award of a PhD scholarship. Having achieved his PhD, Dr. Bold began his own project in launching a new journal, which has now become a distinguished journal, the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies, published by the University of Liverpool. He also held a research fellowship at the University of Lancaster before coming to us. And here he was appointed first lecturer and soon after made the director of the Center for Culture and Disability Studies. He was quick to make his mark in the establishment of a master's degree in disability studies, which began in 2013. And many of the students who have gone through the course are in fact graduates from this university. In 2014, Professor Bolt was listed in the top 10 of the most influential academics with a disability in the UK. And you can see that the list that he was top 10 of was headed by no other than Professor Stephen Hawking. And you will recognize the kind of company our distinguished professor is keeping. He's a senior fellow of the I Education Academy, and perhaps even more importantly, his expertise in learning and teaching was recognized by his own students when he won the student prize for teaching. Professor Bolt is the author of many publications. Indeed, altogether his publications number some 55 books and journal contributions. These include Culture Dis Cultural Disability Studies in Education, Interdisciplinary Navigations of the Normative Divide, publish published by Routledge in 2018, and the Meta-Narrative of Blindness, a rereading of 20th century Anglophone, Anglophone writing published in 2014. Although it would not be appropriate to go into detail, informed by expert advice by some of the highest academics in the field, the university is confident 
that Professor Bold's work will feature significantly in the upcoming research excellence framework, and that, many, and that among his publications, there is a high percentage of work classed as four-star, which means world-leading. As a scholar, therefore, Dr. Bold's profile is unquestionable. Within the university, he's known also as an academic, and this I find particularly endearing uh, to the university, he always finds time to support less experienced members of staff as they begin their own careers in publishing. Professor Newport, as I said, would regret that he's not able to be here this evening as highlighted his, contribu his contribution to the establishment of the early careers researcher framework, which he and his colleagues have contributed to greatly. And this is again designed to help new researchers in the field. <coughs> Professor Bolt also has the ability and the network to bring together high ranking scholars from across the world. And this is seen in his annual conferences that he hosts at the university. And scholars have come to this university from the Far East, North America, and Australasia because of his global reach. He is also a frequent commentator on disability-related matters in the media, including Radio 4's In Touch program and The World at One. He has supervised many uh, research students, and uh, one of those students was, was, came, came to us from abroad who came specifically to be able to work under him because of, of, the, um, of the standing he has in the field. And so, as a scholar and a friend and a valued member of this community, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to introduce you to Professor Bolt, whose lecture this evening is, From Avoidance to Appreciation, the Cultural and Social Values of Disability Studies and Interdisciplinarity. Professor Bolt. Okay, thank you folks. Thank you very much and thanks Vice Chancellor. Thanks to everybody who's come. Um, I'm lucky to have my family here. Uh, my colleagues who are, of course, now my friends and, and students and, and various visitors and so on. I, I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm going to start, actually, by giving a tiny bit of uh, uh, biographical background, uh, a bit of fun, really, but just to, to frame it. But I think what is uh, essential, just because it, I, get, I might get a bit carried away and as we go through the session, I just want to be uh, do what I think is the most important thing, and that's just to thank... Uh, Amy Scott for organising this at relatively, relatively short notice and she's been positive all along um, and I think everyone will agree that, that she's done a brilliant job. So can you show your appreciation before we clap on? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and I'll also thank my, my support worker here, Holly, who's going to be helping me tonight. She's been helping me along the way. And my various colleagues, most notably perhaps my manager, Claire Penketh, but all of my colleagues who are here. Um, you know, today is quite a funny day. It's a one-off experience, isn't it, to, to become, um, you know, to, be, to inaugurate that professorship. It was nice when I got the letter saying I got it, but it's uh, a real celebration today as... Ella and Erin have not let me forget uh, with, with what they've been calling the David Bolt Day um, uh, from breakfast this morning when they both came in and gave me gifts in the office, which was very touching. And then I opened an email from a colleague, Owen, telling his students to come along to this fantastic session and all this stuff, lovely stuff. And then, of course, I went to the session at 1 o'clock that, that Claire did, where she seems to know my work much better than I do, which is a little bit worrying. Um, but uh, it was a lovely... Um, a lovely way to sort of move up towards this. Um, of course, you know, there are loads of people I, I, I really ought, ought to be thanking throughout this, but I should crack on. And I just want you to know, obviously, that that thank is it, thanks, uh, uh, sorry, those thanks are extended to everyone here. Forgive me if I don't mention anyone's name, but we will move on. Um, okay, then, so if we move on to the first slide, this is, uh, as I say, in that biographical mode. Um, so, born in Cardiff, uh, raised in Newcastle under Lyme, and made in Liverpool. 
So uh, I've got to say born in Cardiff to keep my dad happy because um, uh, he was born in Cardiff too. And uh, I'll say his father before him, but that's not strictly true. I think that's Swansea. But uh, for argument's sake, you, you know where I'm going with this. My mum's um, side of the family from Newcastle under Lyme, which is where I've, I've lived for uh, decades, actually, before I came here. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of being Welsh. Not as proud as my dad is of being Welsh, um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, I am proud of being Welsh. Um, and, um, but I'm also proud that I lived in Newcastle under Lyme for a long time, made lots of really good friends that, that I still go and have a pint with now, who I started drinking with in doorways when we were 13 or something. Obviously, that's not for the vice chancellor, but um, uh, for the rest of us, I think you know what I'm saying. Um, and, um, you know, I still go back and have a pint with them, uh, uh, but inside a pub, which is much, much better. Um, and, um, you know, I also uh, am glad that uh, I lived in New Newcastle under Lyme because that's where my brother came along, who is here as well today. Um, and also my daughter. Uh, my daughter's here with her partner. Um, and, um, you know, my daughter was born when I was about 24. Um, so it's, it seems like she's always been around. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So I uh, just wanted to mention some of those things. Um, while we're in that vein, I guess I've talked uh, a, li a, a little bit there about, you know, Cardiff and um, <laughs> Newcastle, London Lyme, very briefly. But the connection with Liverpool um, is not the most obvious one, actually, because when I started the journal, um, that's when I... Um, I first had the, the connection with Liverpool. Before I came to Liverpool Hope, um, I got a, a contract, um, you know, many years ago, actually, uh, for the journal. Um, and then, so when I, I, I saw the job um, possibility at Liverpool Hope, it was more of a coincidence that I was heading towards Liverpool, as it were. But needless to say, um, you know, the vast majority of my achievements have been here at this university. Uh, by far, so, uh, you know, I thank you all for that. Um, uh, I was long-term unemployed before I came to this university. Um, some of the things the Vice-Chancellor has talked about in the past, um, about his life in, a, in apartheid, uh, South Africa and so on, we, we, that are very, very moving to, to us all. Um, and, you know, I can't help but think of my own uh, story in a sm smaller way. Obviously, we're not talking about such an international thing as, as the Vice-Chancellor has um, talked about. But I won't be the first uh, disabled person who found great difficulty in finding a, a, a job. When I got my first job, I'd already got my own journal. And I call it my own journal. I started it, obviously. It would be nothing without, without colleagues. Um, so that's the sort of thing I will be talking about in, in this session. Disability m means many things, but that is one of them. And, and I want that to be on the, on the record, as it were. Um, well, I'm going to talking about that uh, point. Positionality is very important in, in, the, um, in the field that, that, that I work in and, and the field that many of you work in. Um, so I'm saying that up front, aren't I, that um, I'm, I'm a disabled person. You know, I was born with a visual impairment, probably. Certainly, it became apparent when I, in my childhood. Um, and then it was diagnosed when I was uh, 18. I was registered blind at 18. And then I had a, a, a physical impairment that became apparent when I was in my 20s. And that was diagnosed when I was in my 40s because I didn't used to go to the doctors um, and, and so on. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my, my lived experience. But here in the academy, I, I should stress, this is, uh, this is what fuels my, my, uh, my work. This is what fuels those concepts that I name, those theories that I put forward, the, the representations that I... Uh, my approach to those representations, the way I criticize those representations, and indeed, the way I try to um, share opportunities um, and um, j just offer enthusiasm for, my, for the work of my colleagues, because sometimes that's all it takes. You know, a colleague will come to you in, in your office and they've got all the ideas and all you really need to do is just, you know, show them that someone gives a shit about the work and they're, and they're, they're right there. The, the firing off, you know, and, um, and that's all it takes. Um, and that's what often the mentor sessions actually entail, just being really genuinely interested in the work of colleagues, um, the, the great work of, of, of many colleagues here. Um, okay, then, so if we can move on a little bit. Um, okay, then, so this is a, a nice photo, isn't it? 
<laughs> I mean, we've done a puzzle because they don't even understand how these things can, can be put on these slides. Also, because we, so, yeah. yeah. They, so people can recognize these two, yeah, yeah. They, they've changed a bit. Um, this, these film stars on the, on the image are now, have been converted into the, these people who are now my family, as it were. Uh, and that's them on the, at their honeymoon, yeah? So, um, which is quite funny because every picture of them on their honeymoon is of them as individuals. Um, <laughs> because they're so shy, they wouldn't ask a passerby, can you take a photo of us together? So I, I've got to believe that they went together and uh, they are really married, you know. And I've, got, I've got to believe that, but we've got no evidence apart from, you know, not in that photo album anyway. So, um, so I'm, you know, I know that um, I'm lucky to have my mum and dad here. Um, and um, so I just wanted to show that photo just to make sure they're read as, as they need to be, as it were. Um, okay, so fair dues. Let's move on. <laughs> We've got another photo that... Uh, probably is even more, uh, more of a contrast. I show this photo sometimes to the students when they're, if they're lagging a little bit, uh, and they are completely horrified by what can happen to someone in, in their life. They see this person in front of them, i.e. me, and then they see the guy on here. Can you see which one I am? Which, which, which one I am? Everyone recognize the one with the big blonde hair? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like they are so horrified, it, it's upsetting for me. But, you know, I do make the point, well, if you look at yourselves now, you're very beautiful. I was then. You know, the, there is a logic here, isn't there? You know? Um, and you, you, you get some... That's when philosophy comes into play, you know? But uh, uh, just to prove that I was really there with this band, this is a band called Life, so um, it was, you know, my early days were, were, were in punk rock, and then we moved into uh, what you might call pop, uh, punk pop, or when I show Holly that, this photograph, I think she thinks we were a, a punk band, but um, <laughs> it, it's the leather trousers that always throws everyone. I'm still trying to get colleagues now to, uh, to wear leather, and, and I was then, uh, and you can see that no one listened and no one listens. But uh, can we just have a quick burst there, Holly? So this is way back when. I wrote this when I was 17, and I'm, I think I'm 18 or 19, and this, and this is a live recording, so it's poor quality. So that's uh, a quick uh, sample from YouTube. Um, Holly's uh, had the job of putting a lot of my old music on YouTube, which has been hilarious. Um, but uh, uh, just for the record, at that gig, my mum and dad were there, as was my brother. Um, my mum and dad were allowed to come, some of them, but they had to sit at the back, because uh, we were, you know, essentially punk, you know. Um, they were allowed to sit at the front today, all is fine now. Um, but I feel a little bit disappointed that Nisha wasn't there. I feel like she let me down, but of course she hadn't been born at that stage. Um, okay then, we better crack on. Is it the... Um, the other? Yeah, so I've mentioned punk rock uh, along the way a little bit here. I do need to speed, speed up now a little bit, so uh, I hope this is okay. Um, but there's th this quote, and the, my disability studies MA students often find this, and of course I'm familiar with it from way back when, from when I left school. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, you can read my, read my body, but you never read my books. So just think about that quote. This Ian Jury is a disabled punk icon, uh, sadly no longer with us, but he was if you like, proud to be disabled. Um, um, and, and again, that sort of fed into his uh, punk rock career, you know, because he was othered by disability and, and, uh, and punk rock celebrated that, you know? Um, so think about that, um, that quote uh, a little bit because I'm, I use a, a term in my work, critical avoidance. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that a, a little bit more in a moment. But uh, I think in many ways that's, uh, 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 a good illustration of this because you can read my body. I mean, the thing is, disabled people are looked upon, gazed upon um, with some persistence, and yet credit, recognition, uh, that comes with reluctance. And I think that's captured in this, uh, in this quote, uh, which I'll come back to later on, um, the idea that um, people have lots to say about such and such being disabled, um, not so, quick, not so quick to go and read the books, though, 
You know, I, I often um, talk to, to my new students about this. You know, what have you been told about me and so on? What have you heard? Sort of thing. And the books tend to be pretty low in, in, the, in the things they've heard about me, you know, which is interesting. And of course, my ego can just about take it, but uh, let's, let's move on. Um, okay, so anyone who's uh, ever been to any of my sessions or even talked to me for more than about half an hour will know that I always come back to this um, model of prejudicial behavior. 65 years old it is, and I started to use it when I was in my second year undergraduate um, and, um, and still evidently feel that it's useful. Um, one of the things, I, I mean, I'll just talk through this very quickly. Um, so it's a five-part uh, five model, uh, as I said, um, and it moves from anti-locution, which is on the level of language, essentially, um, um, right the way up to, to the worst possible uh, prejudicial behavior, which is extermination. So we move from anti-locution to avoidance, um, to, to uh, <laughs> discrimination, to physical attack, to extermination. Um, so one of the things that struck me straight away is that where avoidance is, so avoidance is higher up than, than you know, the, the sort of, if you like, bad mouthing of people. Um, and that caught my attention when I first came across this work, which is, as I say, classic uh, um, psychosociology or socio-psychology, depending on which way you want to take it. Um, I want to keep coming back to this uh, throughout the session because I think that word avoidance then is, is really important to, to um, underscore in terms of prejudicial behavior because avoidance can sometimes seem so passive that it's not aggressive, if you like. Um, well, according to this, it is, you know, uh, it is part of those, those behaviors. What I'll say very quickly then is that um, looking at this model, uh, Allport's point was not that if you engage in those uh, less extreme levels, not, not if you engage with those uh, levels, do you then, uh, quote, progress uh, to the higher levels, but that they have to be in place, the lower levels have to be in place for the higher levels to happen. Um, I'm not doing a brilliant job of uh, explaining that. I could do with opening it up a little bit, but if you'll just take that uh, for the time being, and I'll, and I'll try to open it up a little bit later. Yeah, okay, so um, I just want to now think about that term then, critical avoidance, and what I might mean by that. Um, when, uh, when representation is considered in the academy, especially in, in the humanities, but not just in the humanities, um, disability is, is widely represented, widely included. You know, there's lots of representations about disability that we and our colleagues will consider um, in the academy. Uh, and that's been the case for a long time. It's often been misrepresented as it goes, but that is the case. If you look through the materials, disability is always there. You might not be shouting out, uh, uh, you might not be that explicit, but it is there. Uh, unfortunately, and lo lots of you will know exactly what I'm gonna say now, um, the critical responses are not there. So every good university will have a copy of Jane Eyre, but they won't necessarily have the critical responses um, that are informed by uh, disability studies. Uh, and that's been the case for, for a long time. Um, things are better now than they were, but that's what I mean by critical avoidance. Um, so the representations are there, but the responses are not. So of course what happens is people start to talk about, let's say Jane Eyre or whatever it might be, Ulysses and, and uh, all the books are available, um, but um, they are not drawing on disability studies. They're not drawing on something that's informed by um, that discipline. And the point about disability studies, as you see right now, and as, as you've already gathered from what I've talked about my background, is it's led by disabled people. Uh, and if not disabled people, then people who have good experience of disability and what I mean by that, you know, people, family, family members and so on who are disabled. That's, in the vast majority, those are the people who lead the field. So obviously it's a profound, uh, sorry, a profoundly informed discipline. And that's often what's lacking in, in the academy, uh, still, uh, alas. Um, as I say, much better now than it was, but um, this, this um, that I want to just think about now then uh, is the meta narrative of blindness, which was my first, uh, effort uh, at um, addressing that critical avoidance. So lots of literature, 
represents blindness. I found that when I was at university myself uh, in undergraduate years. But I did notice that we weren't drawing on the, this thing that might be called disability studies. Um, it really wasn't, it didn't have a presence. Um, so I did my, uh, my PhD, as the Vice Chancellor mentioned. Um, and then <laughs> some 10 years later, I eventually uh, got the, this book published. It's not the PhD, it's a distant relative. Uh, I'm an, and I'm glad it took uh, that long because it became something better than it would have been. Um, it's, a, it's a fair uh, contribution to the field now and it wouldn't have been before, not really. Um, it would have been a PhD, full stop. Um, and so uh, that was where I started in, in terms of this and I was lucky to get this in um, a, a really important series. Um, um, the Corporal Reality series, which is published uh, by the University of Michigan. Okay, let, let's keep moving. Um, I want to just pause on, on the content a tiny bit here. Um, and this idea that, that I put forward that in, uh, in the meta-narrative of blindness. Um, and this is the idea that, um, that I drew from someone called Rosemary Garland Thompson, for those of you who are not familiar with, with her work. Um, but she talks about the, the social encounter and about awkwardness in, in corridors and so on. And when a disabled person meets a non-disabled person, uh, what happens there? And she says that um, in those moments, that person, that disabled person, becomes reduced to just her, his, their disability. So the complex person becomes reduced to just this one quality or this one aspect of identity. That's what Rose McGarland Thompson said. I expanded on that. I, I thought that's, yeah, that makes sense, but there's something more that goes on here, according to my experience, and that's that there seems to be something that is brought to the table as well, a whole, what I called then, um, a sort of uh, a cloud of a narrative under which disabled people find themselves um, existing as it were. So in those uh, encounters, the person is reduced to disability, but then that very disability or that impairment, depending on how we're looking at this, um, keys that person to a whole range of stereotypes, universals, tropes, and so on about disability. Something happens. So they don't come with their own, if you like, micro-narrative, but they become connected to a meta-narrative. Uh, so that's something I just want to park there, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, okay, let, let's move on. So um, you'll see now that I'm going to be focusing very much on book-length projects. That's the idea here today. And I do that for a reason, because obviously there are articles we could talk about. But I want to focus on book-length projects, because I think they are quite significant in terms of knowledge, uh, representations of knowledge, being symbolic of knowledge and indeed indicative of knowledge, because of their... Um, you know, because of their extent. So the second sort of book length project I want to think about for a moment then is called The Mad Woman and the Blind Man, which I uh, edited uh, with two colleagues in New York. Uh, this was my idea, so I'll say that now. I want to make sure the Vice Chancellor knows he's done the right thing by putting <laughs> it. Um, but it would have been nothing without my two colleagues in New York. Their work on Jane Eyre was uh, far superior to my own. But I had the idea of let's approach this uh, famous novel um, from a disability studies perspective unapologetically. So the whole book does just that. So it's got um, uh, you know, eight uh, pretty lengthy chapters and all of them respond to Jane Eyre in a way that is informed by disability studies. Um, and uh, and you know, that, that was a really important development in terms of literary disability studies. So both of these books I've mentioned so far would, would fit that bill, literary disability studies. So I'm, I'm, what I'm raising here is, is a notion of interdisciplinarity. So disability studies is be, being brought together with literary studies, because that's one of the things I do want to draw together at the end. Um, and in that same vein, then I'll move on to, to the next um, slide. And this is just uh, a collection of uh, uh, books from another project. And this um, project is called literary disability studies, so explicitly um, interdisciplinary. Um, so different subjects have been brought together. Um, and again, we insist on having the, that focus on literature here, but from a disability studies perspective. And I, as you perhaps have noticed here, I went back to the same colleagues I went to in, in relation to, to The Mad Woman and the Blind Man in New York, asked them if they'd join me, join me in 
proposing um, this book series, uh, and they both agreed, thankfully. Uh, and now we have seven books that have been published, uh, and there is one in press as we speak. And I've got a, a, a sort of set of these books on, on the slide. Um, I don't know, did Alex Tankard make it here? Ah, excellent. So it, 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 there's lots of great stories uh, connected with my, with my work uh, or my contributions to the field. And Alex in herself is a great story because she was, gave one of the very early sessions on, on, uh, for the CCDS and often uh, joined us. Um, and uh, I think it's okay for me to say that she was sort of not, there was a point where she started to drift away from the academy, is that fair to say? Well, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, she was having doubts, for everyone who can't hear, doubts about a future. And it would have been such a loss, a, a real passionate scholar. It would have been a real loss to the academy. And I just said to her, why don't you, do I, you know, put in a, a pro proposal for this book uh, series? You know, it, it'd be right up your street. Uh, and she did, thankfully. And then she got the book, and then she got the job, etc. cetera. And, and it's, uh, it's so great you know, to see colleagues uh, taking it by the horns and, and, and it working out. And, and this, of course, this series, I could tell stories like that about most of the books. You know, there's lots of connections with CCDS and so on. Um, so, um, you know, as you can tell, I'm quite proud of, of that. Okay, moving on then. Um, in terms of interdisciplinarity, uh, this is obviously, the, well, it's the best thing I've done, isn't it, really? Um, so this is the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies, yeah? Um, and I should thank my brother here, while well, he's here, because I wouldn't be able to start this without my brother, um, because I was... Uh, completely outraged with the way the academy was. Easy when you're, when you're uh, outside the academy, you've got nothing to lose. Um, but I, I didn't understand why there wasn't a journal like this. I talked to my brother, uh, and as ever, his, his response was, well, why don't you sort of give it a go? You know, and I was thinking, well, yeah, maybe. Um, but with his uh, IT skills and so on, we were able to get the thing up and running initially as a, uh, an electronic journal only. Uh, and then it wasn't long before I was approached by publishers uh, who wanted um, to be involved, um, which you know, was always the plan, really, if, uh, if only for the, for the um, sort of legitimacy that it, that it uh, recognises in, in relation to disability studies, and, and specifically here, literary and cultural disability studies. Um, so in this project now, uh, I'm proud to say that lots of my colleagues here at HOPE are involved. It's a very international project, so every time I, I ask a colleague here, they've got to sort of be right in the right place uh, for me to be able to justify that involvement, as it were. And of course, over the years, that has been very much the case. Um, so, you know, in terms of early work of colleagues, you know, early work of Dr. Cheen, Dr. Feeney, for example, has, has appeared in, in, in this journal. Um, and I know in, in the case, you know, it, of the ref and so on, that work um, has, has come from this direction. Uh, which again, quite proud of. Um, in terms of special issues, the guest editors who are in this room right now, you wouldn't hardly believe, but um, even relatively new colleagues like um, Dr. Pritchard, and indeed, I'm not probably supposed to say this yet, but come on, um, Dr. Houston, both of them have got special issues on the horizon. Um, Dr. Pritchard is actually on my machine, never mind on the horizon. Um, the present issue is one that's been guest edited by Dr. Penketh. Um, Dr. Borden is, um, is the comments editor of the journal on a um, general basis, as it were, but also has a special issue on the horizon, as does Anna Bay, Dr. Anna Bay. Um, and of course, now I'm just thinking that there are others as well, let's just say that. I know, I know uh, Dr. Cheen has one uh, coming up as well, uh, and already has one in, in the can, as it were, from, from some years ago. Um, I'll try to make sure that I do remember everybody, but uh, you know, there's lots of work there that, again, uh, is, is good for the university, good for us, and, and uh, good for the field, I think. So note the interdisciplin interdisciplinarity there then, literary and cultural disability studies. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, so now I just want to move, um, so as I say, the, you know, the, the journal has uh, got to be one of my proudest projects, um, but it's grown with and uh, alongside in many ways the, the, the Centre for Culture and Disability Studies. Um, you know, I think that combination, one, one helps the other in many ways. Um, and this being so, um, we have had more than 65 um, guest seminars um, over the, the last 10 years or so. 
Um, and, you know, the, uh, you know, thanks to my colleague, uh, Dr. Borden, many of those are uh, available on the, on the CCDS YouTube channel. Um, but um, this book was sort of invited by Routledge, you know, have you got any books that you want to do? Uh, no, but maybe I could do one on this seminar series we've been doing, I thought. And, and sure enough, I pulled that together. Um, it wasn't that easy because it wasn't really the plan originally, this one. But um, I'm proud to say that, again, colleagues in the room, and um, certainly Dr. Penketh, Dr. Barden, Dr. Caslin, and, um, and Dr. Hodkinson are all in this book. Uh, and the good thing is uh, that we actually got it uh, translated into Korean. So there was another publication that came out of it that means the work of myself and colleagues has, has you know, got that wider audience, as it were. Um, so it's, it's proved to be a, a really uh, nice project in the end. And again, thanks to the, the CCDS seminars and, and people attending and so on. Uh, and, and, and you know, as I said before, colleagues at, at Hope. So I'll move on. Uh, again, this is a, another book in the same series, actually. Uh, I should stress it's not my series. People keep approaching me and asking me if it is because I've got three books in it, but it's not. Um, but um, I am proud to be part of it. Anyway, uh, it's the Advances in Disability Studies uh, by Routledge. Um, and um, this is a book that um, I, I um, edited with, with um, Dr. Claire Penketh, who is, as you know, Head of Disability Studies here and Associate Professor in, in that subject. Um, and what, again, this one sort of is indicative of all the th work we do here insofar as uh, the Vice-Chancellor mentioned the, the biennial conference, um, and we've had five of those, and this was based on one, one, of the, one of the conferences. So again, it brings together the work of colleagues alongside the, the work of, you know, quite, quite well-known international figures like uh, 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 Peter Beresford, for example. Um, uh, that's just one of many examples that I could give here. Um, and, and so that means that we've got that work um, juxtaposed with the work of, like I say, uh, Dr. Penketh, Dr. Waite, Dr. Hodkinson, Dr. Barden. Um, and that's, uh, please tell me I haven't missed anyone who was here. That would be terrible. But anyway, um, you, you can see what I'm saying, that we build on, on work that we do here and that others bring uh, when, they, when they visit. Um, okay, then. Uh, we will move on. So this is a more, a more recent project. Um, this is not yet published, but it's on the horizon. Uh, it should be published uh, by the end of the year, I believe. This is a six book project that I'm general editor with um, a Washington, Washington colleague, uh, Professor Robert McCrewe, who for those of us in the field, obviously we know him very well. He was the first person I went to ask to do this and he, he was keen and we developed the idea together. But it's basically six projects that, um, again, remember that interdisciplinarity thing that I'm, I keep going on about. Well, this brings um, disability studies very much with history, but also with culture. So this is a controversial uh, text for sure, because Robert, neither Robert nor I are, are really historians. Uh, Robert is something of a genius, so I suppose he could put his mind to anything, but we aren't trained historians by any means, so this is going to cause trouble, as it already has a little, but what it does do, for sure, is brings disability to the centre, um, to think in, in Derridian terms. Um, you know, this is pushing the usual uh, focus of history to the side uh, in place of, of, of disability. Even we had the audacity to name impairment groups and so on, which would, wouldn't usually be allowed, um, but we did it with, uh, for the right reasons, a bit like the meta-narrative of blindness. So from an informed perspective, lots of the people who are disabled ac academics who've written this book. Um, and I will say, um, I'm quite proud to say that Dr. Borden has a chapter in the sixth one of this. Not bad company there, because it's, um, that one's um, edited by David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder, two of the most important figures in the field. Um, so I'm really uh, pleased that Owen is involved there. Um, okay, well, I'll crack on, uh, but I'll change the, the tone a little bit now. Um, a lot of this has been quite descriptive. I've just been bang uh, banging out examples of interdisciplinarity. Um, and lots of the disciplines that have been mentioned, you know, along the lines of history, culture, uh, literature, and, and disability studies, and education, of course. Um, but I do want to just focus on, on the the tripartite model uh, for a moment here, because this brings us sort of some, a, a more conceptual 
um, aspect to the work. Um, so this is something I put forward some time ago, and I'll give you an illustration uh, properly in a minute. Um, I've ju this is the, the thing that Claire was talking about in her session earlier on, which she did a brilliant job of, and uh, I must admit, uh, I did say to her, can you do mine tonight? I, I just, uh, you know, she said no. Um, okay then, so what I want to think about then is, yeah, we, we use the same uh, T model, but the idea here is uh, to, to think about disability in a more complex way than, than has been typical. So in the past, for those of you who are uh, less familiar with all of this, in the past, you know, obviously disability was thought of as a negative thing, um, and then it was thought of as a negative thing with some criticism. Uh, what I'm talking about is the social model. So it's a negative thing insofar as being disabled is, is bad, but the reason it's bad is society. And so that's got to be the most important um, model uh, for the disability movement, full stop, end of. Uh, n nothing I say is, is challenging that, so let's be absolutely clear about that. Um, however, uh, other models uh, and other ways of thinking took us down the roots of, if you like, affirmation, disability gain, uh, and, and, and things like this. So this is where disability is, is considered in a far more positive way. Um, and of course, you know, I, I got a real appreciation for both of these. You know, both of these make a lot of sense to me. Um, but often, you know, people are sort of in one camp or the other. Um, that's not strictly true, of course, but that is often the way, the way it is. If you're promoting the social model, it almost seems like you've got to do it to the expense of everything else. And again, that's not always the case, but it is sometimes. Um, so that's really why, where I came in with this model, uh, because for me, uh, disability is... Uh, a bad experience in, in relation to society. So the first part of this model thinks about indifference, the way society goes about its business without, uh, without a care for disability, for dis disabled people. But then the second part of the model, for me, um, might think in terms of difficulties. Um, now, as I've thought about the model more and worked on the model more, these difficulties might be the result of society. I, I accept that, so you can see where I'm drawing that work from. Um, but they also might, might be the result of, of one's embodiment, the way you are, the way we are, the way I am. So those things come into it as well. So just general difficulties about uh, uh, disability from within or without. But then, of course, the, the third element here, which we've just put, I, I referred to this here as qualities for, for ease in many ways. Um, but this is, you know, the wonder of the experience, the identity, the pride of being disabled. You know, I said at the beginning, the first thing I will, you know, have to mention in my family and so on, the first thing I wanted to mention was my disability, that that is something on which I draw. Uh, it, it informs my engagement with the world, um, and therefore it informs my academic output, my uh, thinking, uh, I suppose, ultimately. Um, so... Uh, that's, that's the model that I, I sketched out in, really it was sort of published in 2015, um, but um, I've been working on it since in, in different ways. Uh, one of which is my last book. This is listed, um, can, you, can you go on to the, yeah. So this book here is uh, Cultural Disability Studies in Education. So this is where I bring three disciplines together, essentially, uh, predictably really, because I always was bringing culture and disability uh, together. And then I found myself in a uh, faculty of education with colleagues working uh, in that area and, and started to learn from them and then, um, you know, drew on that work in this, uh, in, this particular, um, uh, in this particular perspective that I put forward. So this is uh, sort of field defining in the sense that it <laughs> defines a field. I don't mean any more than that. Um, but um, this very much draws on... Um, different disciplines, uh, uh, everything from, you know, popular music to humor studies and, uh, and, and Holocaust uh, studies and so on. Um, and I tried to write that in a way that would be useful for students as well as um, uh, academics who want something that they haven't read before, as it were. So probably failed on both, but, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe got somewhere on both as well. Um, but one of the things I will mention in terms of um, this, this particular uh, book is how I illustrated the, um, the tripartite model um, 
in relation to popular music. Now, uh, if we go on to the next slide, Holly, and this is the picture of, uh, a couple of pictures of, of a famous pop star, as it were, um, Freddie Mercury. Um, there's a chapter in, in that book um, that um, I actually look at the work of Johnny Cash and um, Freddie Mercury, and there's a couple of particular videos that they did that uh, are very powerful. Um, they show uh, both of these pop stars uh, essentially at the end of their lives. Um, the, both of them died soon after the, the videos were made. But they are also quite incredible videos. They're really powerful because, you know, that that experience is part of life. Um, the lyrics reflect that experience and so on. Um, I talked about this at a foundation hour that, that um, Claire uh, invited me to, to do some um, uh, earlier this year, I guess. Um, so I won't open that up now, but I did enjoy doing that, actually. Um, um, so this, the point I want to just make here is if you look at these two images, um, and just in case everyone uh, can't see those, um, the first image is, is essentially of um, Freddie Mercury well. Let's put it like that. That's when he's well. I think it might be Live Aid. Um, you know, he's, he's top of his game. Um, He's, he's representing uh, uh, an aesthetic that is, would be described along the lines of beauty and, and so on. Um, the second image is taken from a video when, when as I say, he's, he's got a, 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 you know, he's, he's, he's dying from HIV AIDS, um, essentially. Um, the work is still amazing. Um, so I'll just hold that thought for a moment. But those two images might, might just be uh, considered along the time, uh, along the two uh, the first two parts of my model. So, you know, normative positivisms, there you've got, like I say, Freddie Mercury at Live Aid, possibly. Uh, and then the other image, the, the non-normative negativisms, when, you know, he's, he's having a hard time. You know, he, he was finding it difficult to even stand uh, or even, you know, the clothes were hurting him and things like that that he was wearing. There's a lot of material about this. Um, but it was, it was a, a tough gig, let's put it like that. Um, so there's the two images, but you might think, well, what about the third one then? You know, because the idea of the model is that it breaks down the binary. You know, I always allude to Derrida at some point. Um, and that breaking down of that binary comes maybe from reconsidering that, that second image. Because I've said to Yamsad that that work was some of the greatest work that, 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 that Freddie Mercury did. Um, and I've also said that it was just before he died. So in terms of resilience, you know, that is, that is a, a picture of resilience. So in terms of non-normative positivisms, you know, you, you could consider uh, resilience as an example. And very much, uh, the, you know, Freddie Mercury's performance in that video, in that song, uh, as, a, as a, a good illustration of what I was trying to get at uh, with, with, that, with the tripartite model. Um, so just to be absolutely clear, then the idea is that all of those things often... Um, exist together for the experience of disability, those things coexist. Okay, well, I'll move on. Um, I want to try to draw um, a bit of a conclusion here. Um, and that's by, you know, just obviously drawing some of the things together that I've talked about. So interdisciplinarity, <laughs> interdisciplinarity has been one. Um, so if we think about the tripartite model uh, in, in these terms then, too often in the academy, um, disability just is not really on, on the agenda. Ex uh, you know, it, because often we work, you know, for example, you know, lots of in institutions are working on old, old architecture, you know, that, that really is, wasn't, um, wasn't progressed in a way that, you know, w w was considerate of, of disabled people. And of course, there are lots and lots of examples there. Um, but um, if we think about the second part of the model, um, when it becomes more progressive, then, um, well, actually, no, no, I want to just think about the, the second part in terms of, of difficulties, um, actually. Um, so um, non-normative negativisms in, in the academy, that can often be, um, like I said before, you know, the idea of critical avoidance, you know, so that you know, the work is not there, the, the disciplines are not meeting disability studies. Uh, they're going, the, uh, uh, they're being taught in ways that seem somehow devoid of, of relation uh, to, to, to disability. 
Um, and then the, the third one, of course, is what I'm trying to get at here in terms of um, uh, non-normative positivisms. And that's that when you have this interdisciplinary relationship, when literary studies comes together with disability studies, you get works that are changing um, the, the face of the academy in, in a positive way. You know, so work that, uh, that's been studied for uh, centuries sometimes, but certainly decades, suddenly there's, there's new work to, to draw on, a whole new perspective. It's not just nuanced differences from past work. Brand new perspectives that draw on disability uh, studies first and foremost. Um, so you can see that this is beneficial to, to the academy more broadly. Um, so this is what I mean by appreciation, and that's a word that I use a lot um, when, when I move away from avoidance to appreciation. So disability is no longer uh, framed in terms of uh, um, accommodation or access, but actual appreciation. So you're recognizing what disability brings to the academy. Um, indeed, in the way that um, a disability studies scholar uh, getting a professorship does. You know, that is part of this, and, and that's why I'm, I'm proud to do this. Um, but, of course, what I've been talking about here is, you, you know, some people will be thinking, yeah, it's all quite academic. And, and of course, uh, sometimes that is framed in that way, isn't it? That academic, uh, you know, it's academic and therefore doesn't link to, to the real world. And Claire talked about this uh, brilliantly earlier today. Um, but um, one of the things that came out of the session that, that, that Claire did is, you know, that so often that, is, that lived experience is very much entangled with the so-called academic. Um, and, and I will say then that the, the, the real um, reason for all of my work actually, uh, it maybe it's captured in this, this image now, um, which I, I, so I try to challenge what I would refer to as um, um, the normative um, social order. Now on, this, on these pictures here, you've got you know, quite, quite clearly, disabled people being helped by non-disabled people. Um, that's fine. I've got no issue with that. I'll say this, I'm probably a disabled person in this room who is helped by more people than anyone else here. Of course, that might not be correct, but it's, there's something in it. You know, I'm first to admit that I need help and respect and appreciate help. It's all good. Um, what I don't appreciate is the way in which that becomes set as the only option. So what I mean by that is when people are outside the realms of appreciation. So these sort of pictures are quite easy to find. Um, not quite so easy to find um, the alternative uh, or the deeper story, you know. Um, so too often that uh, notion, that what I was calling before the meta-narrative of disability, that gets taken uh, into the home, into the workplace and so on. So uh, if you follow that, then the disabled leaders of, of companies and uh, courses and so on uh, find it quite difficult to sort of uh, get their due respect. You know, it's too easy to be left off lists, uh, to be outside uh, meetings and so on. Um, this is the sort of things that people have told me about from around the world. This is not um, my anecdotal um, information. You know, this is uh, lots of... Uh, uh, research that, that's explored these things. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm trying to challenge with all of my work from the word go to the present. Um, so uh, today I've been talking about, as I say, book length projects for the simple reason that they represent knowledge in, in, a, uh, in a considered way that is actually quite difficult in the, in the British uh, Academy because we're kind of encouraged to do papers first and foremost. I encourage my uh, mentees to do that. So I'm part of the same system. But ultimately, it's those book length projects that, that represent knowledge, in, in, as I say, in, in a powerful way. Um, and those book length projects that have always been the most threatening. We, you know, we know that, uh, what, that it's a historical uh, uh, line there you know, that, that might take us to Nazi Germany, the burning of books and so on. That's because they are so threatening, you know, um, because of that extensive... Uh, knowledge base that every book can potentially contain. Um, and, um, and of course, if you've got a problem with disability or disability studies, the idea of books, theories, uh, and so on, and indeed 
knowledge that's based on disability studies is, is actually very difficult because it threatens that social order. So I'll just finish off by going back to uh, what Ian Jory said, and I'll just tweak it a little bit. So uh, uh, read my body, as you know you will, but read my books too. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is uh, Michael Lavalette. I'm uh, the Professor of Social Work and Social Policy here at Liverpool Hope. And it's my honour and privilege to be the respondent to David on the occasion of his inaugural lecture. Um, first of all, I want to thank David because it's a very brave man that stands up here and shows a picture of yourself with a blonde mullet and black leather trousers. Um, and I think for nothing else, he will be remembered long for that. Um, his start off in his biography, I think, was also uh, pertinent for my, myself as well because he showed pictures of his parents on their honeymoon and said they were never there together. And I have similar pictures in my store of both my mum and dad on their honeymoon, um, not together, but taken separately. Uh, but I have got irrevocable proof that I, at least, uh, uh, that, that they were definitely there together because they were, born, they were married on the 3rd of March. 1962, and I was born on the 3rd of December 1962, so if you do the maths, they were definitely on honeymoon together. Um, so, um, excuse me, I'll put my glasses on. Um, I wanted to say, really, uh, that uh, David and, in fact, the entire disability team um, have recently joined uh, the, the School of Social Sciences here at the University, uh, uh, Liverpool Hope University. And uh, as I've got to know both him and the team, um, I, it's been a great pleasure to start to work with them and to uh, look at the ways in which we can um, embed the perspectives that he has talked about today, embed the perspectives of disability studies into our social science programmes more generally, to make sure that we are not, uh, 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 due to undue criticism of, of avoidance that, that David spent so much time talking about. And what I suppose I wanted to think about was just the, the, the way in which disability studies itself kind of relates to some of the other social science disciplines and social work. Because disability, disability studies is a relatively new academic discipline. I say that in a sense because it makes me feel a lot younger than I am. When I say relatively new, I'm talking about 30 to 40 years, but it makes me seem young if I say still relatively young. But it, it's not been in, the, in the, the, the academy like theology or English with hundreds of years uh, uh, behind it. And like other studies, like the women's studies or black studies, its roots were formed in the struggle of service users and activists within the disability social movements that grew out of what are often called the movements of the 1960s. In the UK, that's organisations like the Union for Physically Impaired Against Segregation, which was uh, formed in 1972, or the Mental Patients Union, which was uh, formed in 1973, and both of which were out there to challenge society, uh, to challenge the norms of society, to challenge the state, to challenge the way in which discrimination was embedded within societies, but also challenge the academy because the academies weren't thinking about disability issues or women's issues or black issues in appropriate ways. And so the movements for disability studies and women's studies and black studies have their roots in that challenge to a broader society in, in that way. Um, and disability studies therefore always has uh, both a, a, a strong theoretical discipline but also a very clear practical uh, and activist orientation as well. It is about challenging the present and challenging norms. It is about challenging the assumptions that too often are left un uh, unchallenged uh, as, we, as we write our programmes or as we form our policies or as we go about our daily activities in whatever way we can. David started off with biography, and it brought to, to me um, the, the early slogan of the disability movement, which was that there should be nothing about us uh, without us. And it seemed to me that in a very practical sense, what David is doing in his academic work is, is shouting that from the rooftops as an academic. There should be nothing about disabled people without listening to the voice of disabled people and disabled activists. And I think as he took us through 
the books and the articles, the journals and the centre and all the work that he's involved in, you could see that that was a very clear shout, a very astute academic with a clear theoretical perspective, but with a focus on making the world a better place, not just in the academic world, but a better place for people with disabilities and people who don't have disabilities in the same, in the same way. So David's lecture, I think, provided us with a, a great biographical trail. Um, as I say, I'll never forget the, the blonde mullet. I will remind him about it often. Um, I think it set the train in terms of how we think about disability, both in theory and in practice, and the implications of that. I certainly will be leaving here this evening thinking more about his T model and what that means in terms of the work that I do in social work or social policy or that colleagues in other disciplines in our school do as well. It's set in train a way of thinking about perhaps the ablest assumptions of the state and society within which we live um, and our understandings, our deeper understandings of the world in which we are all part. So listening to David for me was a great pleasure. It was a challenge and it was an inspiration. And so formally, I would like to just thank David very much for, uh, for his lecture and to con congratulate him on his inaugural professorial lecture. I should have said at the beginning of our meeting today that uh, this is the 175th anniversary of the, first, the founding of the first college of Liverpool Hope University, which goes back to 1844. And therefore, these inaugural lectures and other distinguished lectures you see are bad as celebrating our 175th. Let's go back to 1844. There were only six universities in England, um, two of them medieval, but all six of them didn't admit women or Catholics, or Jews. And that was the England of the 1840s, when our first college is established, and a second one two years later, when John M.D. Newman, who was this week declared a saint, writing his famous essays um, in Ireland across the, the water, our second was born in 1856, again a Catholic foundation. and. Um, we think of those days, and you, you gather from our history that in the DNA of this place, this university, is the will and the commitment to make a difference in the world. And I think if we're celebrating 175 years, David, your lecture today captures very much the vision of the university to make a difference, to be at its very best subversive of the order we are forced to live by. And so, um, if you wouldn't mind coming forward, David, before you go out and, and greet your guests at the door, there is a token we give to all our inaugural professors, which says, presented to Professor David Bold on the occasion of his inaugural professor, professorial lecture, the title of today's lecture is, um, uh, is, is printed, but more importantly, this day, Wednesday, 16th of October, 2019. That will be remembered. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll give David a chance to make it to the door before you leave to greet you. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Good night.